after we've considered the human host and many of its resident biota, let's take a look at some of the pathogenic biota, which could be exogenous biota or overgrowth of endogenous biota. So pathogenicity is the organism's potential to cause disease. We consider both true and opportunistic pathogens. True pathogens naturally are going to be pathogenic to a healthy individual versus opportunistic pathogens are going to be pathogenic only to compromised individuals. So opportunistic pathogens are not considered pathogenic to healthy individuals. The type and severity of an infection depends on the pathogenicity of the organism as well as the condition of its host. The figure on the right shows us that we need to consider both the microbe situation as well as the host situation. We have a number of slider bars, for example, virulence, then how many microbes are there, as well as whether there's an appropriate portal of entry. In the host, we'll consider the genetic profile, whether the host has previously been exposed to microbe X, and the general level of health of the individual. We can have a number of different effects. First of all, the microbe could pass through unnoticed. It could become established without colonizing infecting or without causing disease, or the microbe could cause disease. So three possible outcomes that are based on whether the sliders are in the correct ranges, whether the microbe's toggle switch is in the yes position, and whether the host toggle switch is in the no position. Now, of particular interest if the, is this slider bar over here on the left, where we consider the genetic profile of the host. For example, a few individuals have a gene that makes them much less likely to be infected by HIV. Basically, this gene produces an inappropriate docking protein, so HIV has a much harder time entering the cells. Another example is sickle cell disease. We've already explored this a little bit already, but in Africa, there is a mutation in the hemoglobin gene, which causes non-functional hemoglobin, but also allows a protective effect against malaria, such that carriers of the mutated hemoglobin gene, or the sickle cell gene, have resistance to malaria, so the malaria cannot get into the red blood cells to reproduce. However, they also possess very few or no sickle cell symptoms. So this sickle cell allele is maintained in the population because of its protective effect against the pathogenicity of malaria. Now let's consider this lower right slide bar. It's of interest too. This is the general level of health of the individual. And I like to address this because we're just learning that the level of stress hormones has a vast impact on how susceptible we are to microbial growth. For example, stress hormones like norepinephrine cause a 10,000-fold increase in the growth of E. coli in the gastrointestinal tract. And other hormones increase the propensity for formation of biofilms and others increase the expression of the pathogenic genes in the microbes, so they have much higher virulence levels. This is really intriguing new research, and really, once again, shows us that stress truly has the impact to kill. So it's super important for us to manage our stress. Here's two words to think about. Dis-ease, as in unease in the mind, manifests itself as disease in the body. There's only one space in the difference of the spelling of these words, and it's so, so true. Here's more evidence. Now let's consider the word virulence. We often use virulence and pathogenicity pretty interchangeably. However, we do need to understand the difference. Virulence describes the degree of pathogenicity. So they are certainly related. So the severity of a disease caused by a pathogen depends upon its virulence. And the virulence is determined by the organism's ability to establish itself in the host and cause damage in the host. There's a lot involved in both of these steps. 
to establish themselves in a host, microbes have to enter the host, attach firmly to the host tissues, and then survive the host defenses. That covers establishing itself in the host. But in addition to that, we have to cause damage. So the microbe has to produce toxins or induced a host response that is actually injurious to the host itself. So naturally, there are a lot of variables as to whether the microbe can cause issues for the host or infection in the host. Any characteristic or structure the microbe possesses that contributes to its ability to do either of these steps, either establish itself or cause damage, is considered to be a virulence factor. As you're probably aware, different healthy individuals have varying responses to the same microbe. Most of this is due to the genetic variations that we see in defense systems. In the next slides, we're going to cover the varying effects of virulence, as well as the stages in the progress of an infection. So we'll begin by looking at how microbes become established. This is step one, considering the portals of entry. How do microbes enter our body? Usually, they'll either come in through a cutaneous or membranous boundary. And the source of microbes can either be exogenous from the outside or endogenous sources, those that already live within us and have maybe grown out of control. Normally, they come from the same anatomical regions that support normal biota. For example, our skin, our gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, and the urogenital tract. And the majority of pathogens have adapted to a specific portal of entry. For example, the influenza virus is adapted to enter the mucous membranes. It simply can't enter through the skin. Mycobacterium tuberculosis enters through both the respiratory and GI tract, so some are adapted to several different portals of entry. For example, again, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus invade through the skin, the urogenital, and the respiratory tracts. So there's a wide variety of portals of entry that could potentially be used. We'll begin by looking at how microbes enter through the skin. First of all, there really needs to be some form of nick abrasion or puncture that could be formed by a bite, a cut, or a needle. Intact skin on its own is very tough, so few microbes can actually penetrate the skin. Plus, it has an acid mantle to protect us from those entries. Some organisms, however, are able to create their own passageways using digestive enzymes or bites. For example, there are certain helminth worms that produce enzymes that break down the skin and allow them to pass in. We've also become highly aware from our wiki postings that insects can bite and introduce microbes, but also other animals can bite and introduce microbes. Contaminated needles are also a big source of microbes entering through the skin. Usually there's microbes on the skin that can be introduced by using the needle. Plus there could be microbes on the needle itself. HIV, hepatitis, and tetanus are often introduced through these manners. Here you can see there are some examples of other microbes that will enter through the skin. Most of these you're familiar with because we've already posted to the wiki on infections of the skin and eyes. So Staphylococcus aureus causes those gross boils that we've looked at. Streptococcus pyogenes causing impetigo. Hemophilus aegyptus causing pink eye. Chlamydia trichomatis or causing trichoma or granular conjunctivitis, little bumps form on the underside of the eyelids, or Neisseria gonorrhea, which causes gonorrhea. Again, all of these are introduced through the skin, but the skin generally has to have some form of nick abrasion or puncture in order to permit entry. The gastrointestinal tract is another big portal. Pathogens that are contained in food, drink, and other ingested substances enter through the GI tract. These pathogens are highly adapted to survive digestive enzymes as well as great pH changes that we see going through the digestive tract. Examples of these are Salmonella, Shigella, Vibrio, certain strains of E. coli, 
because we have some endogenous E. coli that need to be there. But there are other pathogenic forms of E. coli. The polio virus can enter through the GI tract. Hepatitis A virus, echovirus, rotavirus, and histolytica we've seen, as we have with many of these in the wiki postings about GI infections. Giardia lamblia, one that's very familiar to most of us living in the mountain environment and hiking around. Next, another membranous portal of entry, the respiratory system. This is where we see the greatest number of pathogens entering our bodies. It's because of the continuous membrane surface that covers the upper respiratory tract as well as all of our sinuses and the auditory tubes that allow microbes to be transferred from one site to the other and perhaps be able to invade to a state of infection. Some examples we see are streptococcal sore throat, meningitis, diphtheria, whooping cough, influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, and the common cold. Now, sometimes we can have particles that are inhaled and make their way deeper into the lower regions of the respiratory tract. This is where we see some bacteria and fungi having the ability to cause a variety of different pneumonias. Our final portal of entry is the urogenital portal of entry. Now mostly here we're considering sexually transmitted diseases. However, not all urogenital infections are STDs. We see that it's about a 4% rate of infections worldwide are STDs. That means in the United States, approximately 13 million new cases each year. So 4% may seem like a low number, but that it means a lot of cases. These pathogens enter the skin or mucosa of the penis, the external genitalia, the vagina, the cervix, and the urethra. Many cannot penetrate an unbroken surface. However, there are many that are able to penetrate an unbroken mucosal surface. Some examples we see are syphilis, genital warts, chlamydia, herpes, trichomonas, which is a protozoan that causes trichomoniasis, HIV, and hepatitis B. These are all STD examples of urogenital infections. There are some non-STD urogenital infections. For example, when we see the natural biota of the GI tract being transferred accidentally to the urogenital tract, which happens commonly in females, those are bladder infections. So this is caused from endogenous bacteria being in the wrong location. The table here on the right shows us the incidence of some of the commonly sexually transmitted diseases. We've seen an increase in human papillomavirus, as well as trichomoniasis, and a decrease in things like syphilis and gonorrhea in recent years. Again, chlamydias and herpes increasing in incidence. Now, there's a special group of pathogens that can also infect during pregnancy and the birth process. Some can cross the placenta. Now, the placenta is an exchange organ. It's composed of both fetal and maternal tissues, and it keeps the fetal blood separate from the mother's blood, however, permits diffusion of nutrients across it. In general, it's a really good barrier and prevents microbes from crossing it and infecting the fetus. However, there are some microbes, for example, the syphilis spirochete, that can make their way across that placental barrier. Most other infections that infect a fetus occur perinatally, so around the time of birth, when the child becomes contaminated in the birth canal. Now, there's a nice acronym called TORCH, which helps health professionals consider all of the different possibilities. TORCH means toxoplasmosis. Other diseases, the other diseases include hepatitis B, AIDS, chlamydia, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and the herpes viruses. So each of these TORCH pathogens can easily infect a fetus as it passes through the birth canal. Any of these infections in the mother can result in early termination of pregnancy, premature birth, and even death in some cases. So it's very important for a mother to be tested for each of these torch diseases during her pregnancy. 
Another thing to consider in the portal of entry is the size of the inoculum, as in how many microbes are in the inoculating dose. If there's not enough, then we won't see an ensuing infection. Most agents, the infection only proceeds if the infectious dose is present. We call the infectious dose the ID. In general, microorganisms with smaller IDs have greater virulence. So here's some examples. The ID for Q fever, the causative agent of Q fever, is just one infectious cell. So a very small ID and a very high virulence. It only takes 10 infectious cells for tuberculosis, the ID of 10. For gonorrhea, it takes 1,000. For cholera, the ID is 1 billion. Numbers below the ID will generally not cause an infection. However, if there's a much higher dose in the inoculum, then the onset of infection can be extremely rapid. Now we've considered step one of becoming established, the different portals of entry and the size of the inoculum that's required. Now we'll move on to step two, that is, how the pathogens actually attach to the host and become resident.